Well, greetings and welcome to Life Steps for April 19th, 2020. I trust everybody had a nice week, a profitable week. Today we're going to be looking at Psalm 145. But before we do, let's have a word of prayer. O oh Lord, open our eyes that we may behold wondrous things out of thy law. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to be aiming to do a little bit more than scratch the surface of the Psalms as we go through. But to tell you the truth, the depth of the Word of God, as, as you all know, is such that um, there is much, much to do and there's much in the way of richness and treasure to be mined from these Psalms. Psalm 145 is a glorious, beautiful psalm. It is supernatural and it is very, very powerful. So there's no way we're covering this in a single pass. We'll do the best we can. Maybe it'll provide an open door so that, so that we can research a little bit further. By the way, there are good resources online that you can readily access there'll be much that you can find online. Uh, if you're being quarantined at home now, as most of us are, you can do much online to find out a whole lot about Psalm 145. And if, if you're a little bit discriminating in what you're looking at, um, you're going to find some good material out there. You'll be able to do some more searching in depth and that, let alone the paper commentaries and much that's been written on this psalm. Now, psalm 145 is what is known as a praise psalm. We touched on that last week, what the praise psalm is. And Psalm 145 was written by David to show the position of honor and dignity that David was accorded. Psalm 145 is the last of, you would say, maybe the regular psalms before the final grand finale of psalms, which ends the entire book of psalms because that begins in Psalm 146, and then it rises to a crescendo of exuberant praise in Psalm 150. That's the grand fa fireworks finale of the book of Psalms. And so the last of the Psalms before that is Psalm 145, and that's the one we're looking at today. It is the position of honor and dignity at the end of the book of Psalms, and rightly so, because David was the sweet psalmist of Israel. Now, Psalm 145 occupies a position of great dignity in the Jewish worship system. And it was the primary component, and I'll read here, it was the uh, primary component of a daily Hebrew prayer known by the Hebrew term Asherah, which means something like happy. And... Um, this particular psalm is, um, or this particular prayer is composed mostly of Psalm 145, but there were two other verses from Psalm, which were 84 and 144, that were then added at the beginning of this psalm. And to complete the prayer, there was a verse from Psalm 115 added at the end. Together, these were Asherah. And the thing about this, particular prayer is that it was accorded so much power. They, uh, the, the Jewish, the rabbis, really had a great deal of respect and reverence for this psalm. Rabbi Elazar is quoted in the Talmud tractate uh, Brakot 4b as saying, and listen carefully to this claim that he makes, Whoever says the psalm, which we call Asherah, that's Psalm 145, has, has uh, three times a day, is a person who can rest assured that he will inherit the next world. Really, that he will inherit the next world, that is heaven, because he recites this psalm three times a day. Well, what would give it so much power? We know that in Jewish worship, it was recited twice in the morning. 
It was recited twice in the morning according to the Jewish worship practice, and then was also it was also recited once in the afternoon. So there's three times a day. But what gives it its strength and its power? Uh, well, let's read about that. According to this rabbi, it arises from two, two different aspects of the psalm. The first is the, is the fact that it is what is known as an acrostic psalm and it has the Hebrew alphabet in it. That is the first word of each of the verses of the psalm begins with a letter of the Hebrew alphabet in order from Aleph to Tav. And so from beginning to end, the Hebrew alphabet is represented in this psalm, all 21 verses even though there are 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet. Well, we'll talk about that in a minute. Don't let me forget to bring that up. But uh, we do need to cover that. Um, and so for the Jews, this represents the Torah or the law. And that is because the alphabet, the alphabet here represented causes us to be reminded that it is the law of God that is the source of the creation and also for all good things in our lives. Of course, you can't see it in English, but in the Hebrew, if you can, if you get a Hebrew Bible and you look at the first letter of these verses as you go down through and then, you know, start, have the Hebrew alphabet next to it, you'll find it goes right down through. In English, it would, a, B, it would be A, B, C, D, E, and so on. But in Hebrew, it's according to the Hebrew letters of the alphabet. But that makes it um, reminiscent of the Torah, and it helped the Torah. And the Torah, of course, is God's law. The second aspect that this particular rabbi spoke of, and let me see if I can find my notes. Somehow I got turned around a little bit here. Believe it or not. The second aspect of this psalm pertains to verse 16. And it speaks of God's hand being open to sustain all living things. This is not just man, but it's all living things that he's created. When we realize that it is only God who is willing to help us, and not just us, but all living things, all living beings, then we can realize that food and the necessities of life do not depend on us alone. This realization can bring us back into focus and bring us closer to realizing our dependence on God and to bring us closer in further into the study of his holy word. And Jesus points to the same thing in Matthew 6, verses 30 to 34, when he says, Take no thought saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink? Your heavenly Father knows that you have need of all these things. So God provides. So according to this rabbi, that the power of the Psalms uh, resides in these two factors, that it emphasizes the utmost importance of Torah or law, God's word, and also it emphasizes that it is God who provides for us, that we don't have to fret and worry over the day-to-day -day needs of life, but it is God himself who has provided and will provide. So those two reasons give it a great deal of power. Um, now the one thing we skipped over and we need to go back. Remember we said there are 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet? But the psalm only has 21 verses, and therefore, obviously, one of the letters of the alphabet is not represented in the verses of this psalm. And which one is it? It's noon. A verse for the letter noon or the 14th letter is missing. The psalm goes from the 13th letter, which is mem, 
to the 15th letter, Samak. But why? Why is one verse missing? Well, a passage from the Talmud, or, or Jew, Jewish uh, teaching, suggests that King David, who is traditionally believed to be the author of most of the Psalms, according to the Talmud, intentionally omitted the verse because Nun would connote nephila, or downfall. Especially the verse in Amos 5 and verse 2, which reads as follows, The maiden of Israel has fallen, Nephila. She will not rise again. Abandoned in her homeland, there is none to raise her up. And in this interpretation, the psalmist didn't want to mar his hymn of praise by reminding worshipers of how much suffering they sometimes endure. And yet, on the other hand, he can't deny the inevitable fact we do suffer so so this interpretation goes you have successes and painful failures and the psalmist must admit that the failures do happen the downfalls are real so he embeds a noon in the very next verse that is uh, the one for the letter summic and so we read in uh, the following verse God supports those who have fallen and straightens out all who are bent. You see, fallen, that was the word that was supposed to have, uh, according to this interpretation, that would have been the word that is supposed to have been at the beginning of the previous verse, which was left out, so as not to be a, a damping influence on this hymn of praise. And instead, it was put in the following verse so that it would still be there, but it would not be the beginning of one of the verse. So, a person of faith worships by affirming that even through crises and catastrophes, we experience God's grace and support. One final word before we look at the psalm itself. The structure of the psalm is right around the key words um, which, which describe the qualities and characteristics of God and then our human praise toward him. So the repetition of key words serves to indicate the structure. And if you look at the psalm, kind of want to do a little bit of an exercise here as I read these words off. Look and see in your translation if you can see these words as I'm reading them. You're going to see some of them because in any translation, you're going to find some, if not all of these. So look for these words. The structure of the psalm is built around these. Bless, praise, works, mighty acts, kingdom, splendor, greatness, love, goodness, righteousness, and desires. So following that, the structure goes this way, praising God. Verses 1 through 2, praising God in verse 10, praising God in verse 21. God's greatness in verses 3 through 6. God's greatness in verses 11 through 13a. And God's goodness in verses 7 through 9. And God's goodness in verses 13b through 21. With that in mind, let's turn to Psalm 145. So if you don't have your Bible out yet, you probably do. But let's turn there and take a look and cover a few verses, and we'll talk about them a little bit. Verse 1, I will exalt you, my God, the King. I will praise your name forever and ever. The psalm begins in the first person. That is I. It is an individual. I will exalt you, my God, the King. So this is praise of a person, an individual. It is sets the mood for the entire psalm of praise. As we mentioned last time, the psalmist says he will praise God forever and this is in keeping with God's eternality and praiseworthiness. We will see in verse 3 that God's greatness is unfathomable. It is without limit. It is unsearchable. And so it makes sense for the psalmist to say that he will praise God forever because there is no limit to the depth of God and there should be no limit to praising him. Now in human terms, we praise one another for things that are worthwhile, noteworthy, good, 
excellent, the things that show character and fortitude and stamina, things like that. We praise a child for finally prevailing to ride his bicycle. And we say, isn't that a wonderful, praiseworthy thing? And we praise a young man for graduating, and we praise him for doing an act of kindness. And these things are worthy of praise. But they fade in time. What man who's 50 years old is still being praised for learning to ride a bicycle? But the praises of God are not that way. The praises of God are ever new. The praise of the eternal and all-wise God must be continuing as we learn more about him from day to day, because we do learn new things about him. If we are in his word and if we are regenerate people and uh, devoted to serving him, we learn more about God every day. We learn more about how good he is, how awesome he is. So it's not like the praise for men. It's not like the praise of men. We continually learn more, and so our praise must never cease. The bottom line, as we learn more about him, we see how awesome he truly is. And this is an ongoing process that never finishes. The writer of Lamentations says this. We all know the verse. Lamentations 3, 22 to 23. His compassions fail not. They are new every day, every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. So it's every day. The praise that wells up from our hearts as we see how awesome he is every day in some new way in some new thing we haven't seen before, and we are forever discovering the depth of God's goodness and his great love. Now verse 2, Every day I will praise you and extol your name forever and ever. We've already said that the psalm was read twice a day, in, or three times a day, I'm sorry. It was read three times a day in Jewish worship. We've also said that um, the Talmud says that uh, by reciting this Psalm three times a day, that you would have a share in the world to come. But we should also say that in praise that we're almost, you could make an argument that we're seeing the very purpose of human existence. You could make a case for that. The Westminster Shorter Catechism begins on this same note. Now this is getting to the purpose of human existence. What is the chief end of man? The chief end of man, and that is the chief purpose of man. Another way of saying, why are we here? The chief end of man is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. Now verse 3. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. This speaks of the greatness of God as one of his divine attributes. And no one can fully understand his purposes or his ways. In the presence of the divine kings, humans, human beings must admit their limitations. Job said, God, which doeth great things and unsearchable, marvelous things without number. And the prophet Isaiah would say, Hast thou not known, hast thou not heard? that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, fainteth not, neither is weary. There is no searching of his understanding. Now the NIV reads as follows in this verse, his greatness no one can fathom, can fathom. And I don't know how many of you are familiar with that term. It's a nautical term. And it speaks of determining the depth of water by dropping a weighted line over the side. It would be a heavy lead weight or something. The depth of the water is determined by measuring how much rope goes out before the weight hits the bottom. It's a simple concept. But why does the psalmist say that nobody can fathom the depth of God's greatness? Well, the original language doesn't use this nautical term. This is something I, I see in the NIV here. 
my translation. But it's pretty good. I mean, it helps give us a picture. And you can imagine this. And we're talking about the greatness and etern eternality of God. What if the psalmist then had, from his boat, cast over a, uh, a weighted line to fathom the depth of God? He would have thrown that weight over the side 3,000 years ago, trying to plumb the depth of God's greatness. And now 3,000 years later, it would still be sinking deeper and deeper. There is no searching of his understanding. Isaiah writes in um, Isaiah 40, verse 28, there is no searching of his understanding. The depth of his understanding is beyond human comprehension. Also, the depth of his love, his love for us, his great wisdom. There's no end to it. There's no plumbing the depth of God. And that is why we praise him, and our praise will be eternal and everlasting forever, as the psalmist writes, great is his wisdom and love. That's as far as we're going to get today. We'll pick up again here with verse 4 next week. Have a great and blessed week, and thank you.